Blessings of the Triple Gem, Deruan Saranai. In today's Dhamma session, we are going to begin to examine the Bojangas or factors of enlightenment. I will be using these terms interchangeably. In this first session, we'll primarily be looking at an introduction or an overview so we understand the context of the Bojangas within the Buddhist teachings, as well as their importance to realizing the ultimate goal of our spiritual path and practice. Let's begin by paying homage to the Buddha. We can bow our heads and Anjali. Homage to the Buddha. Homage to the Dhamma. Homage to the Noble Sangha. We are grateful to the Buddha and the Noble Ones for teaching us this Noble Dhamma. And we strive to be easy to instruct so we can uplift our minds to understand this Dhamma. In this session, we will start by reviewing our understanding of bhavana. This is important because it helps us to confirm where the bhujangas fit when it comes to the whole spiritual path and how everything is linked and interwoven. And then we'll delve into the suttas, including the bhujanga sangyutta. This is chapter 46 of the Sangyutta Nikaya. And here we'll examine what makes the factors of enlightenment unique why are they called the factors of enlightenment? We'll make reference to the Buddha's simile of the rafters of a peaked roof, and we'll acknowledge the relationship between the hindrances and the factors of enlightenment. And then we'll look at some of the important attributes and application of the factors of enlightenment. In this initial Dhamma session on the Bojangas, we'll focus on them as a collection first. In subsequent sessions, we'll look at how to develop each of the Bojangas by examining some of the meditations. Before we launch into the Bojangas, let's review our understanding of Bhavana. Bhavana has been translated as meditation, which is quite an unusual word and concept. There are other translations of Bhavana, which include developing by means of thought, cultivation of the mind, applying thought to, and training one's mind. What we draw from these is the developing, cultivating, or training one's mind by thought. When we use the word bhavana in the context of the Buddha's teaching, this is what we mean, to develop the mind by thought. And the question that arises is, what thoughts? And the broad answer would be Buddha's words, Buddha's instructions, Buddha's step-by-step -step teachings, the Dhamma the Dhamma Vinaya. And yes, this is what we do when we do our Sutta meditations. Now, if we look on this slide, we can see that the Buddha taught us the Four Noble Truths. Everything he teaches fits into the Four Noble Truths. So if we were to explain meditation, we would reference the Four Noble Truths, which is the Noble Truth of Suffering, the Noble Truth of the Origin of Suffering, the Noble Truth of the Cessation of Suffering, and the noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. The reason why we gravitate to the Buddha's teachings is because we have some understanding of the Four Noble Truths and some confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And so we want to develop the path that leads to the cessation of all suffering. Buddha taught when we are asked what is the purpose of the spiritual path, we should answer that it is the ending of suffering. And this is from the Kimathya Sutta, Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 45, discourse number five. So then meditation or developing the mind by thought is really about developing the Noble Eightfold Path, starting with right view, right thought, also called right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. This is the path leading to the destruction of greed, hatred, and delusion, which means the ending of suffering. As shown, by developing this Noble Eightfold Path, we also develop the body. This is Bhavita Kaya, and we develop virtue, which is Bhavita Sila. And then we develop the mind, which is Bhavita Chitta, and we develop wisdom, which is Bhavita Panya. These help to activate the other bodhipakya dhammas or enlightenment factors. Essentially, the Noble Eightfold Path helps us to see things as they really are with proper wisdom. 
If you've been learning and practicing the Insight Pathways and Sutta Meditations on this channel, then you know that is what the Buddha's instructions are helping us to do. The Buddha continuously gets us to establish right view. And then right thought and all these other path factors follow. As we train in higher virtue, concentration and wisdom, it leads to right knowledge and right liberation. So then it becomes the tenfold path. So again, the path of non-greed, non-hatred and non-delusion. It will ultimately help us to destroy the taints. These are the things many of us have heard before, but it's important to let those words really sink in. If we don't follow the Buddhist instructions to develop this Noble Eightfold Path in whatever meditation we do, whether it is in our loving kindness meditation or contemplating the four nutriments or mindfulness of breathing as examples, then we can infer we are developing the wrong path, the path that keeps leading us to the wrong concentration, still rooted in greed, hatred and delusion. And therefore, there is no possibility of noble attainment and we remain bound to this whole mass of suffering. In the Virada Sutta, the Buddha stated, because those who have neglected the noble eightfold path have neglected the noble path leading to the complete destruction of suffering. Those who have undertaken the noble eightfold path have undertaken the noble path leading to the complete destruction of suffering. So this is one meaning of the path, as in the fourth noble truth, the path leading to the cessation of suffering. This is what we are meant to develop when we meditate. The other meaning of the path is the seven factors of enlightenment, which we have depicted down here. So this means thinking or contemplating in accordance with the Buddha's instructions so we know when we have fully perfected each factor of enlightenment. Now the Pethika Buddha also confirms this, defining the path as being two things, the Noble Eightfold Path, or in that case they translated it as the Noble Eight-Factored Path, and they quoted the Dhammapada verse saying, this is the only path, no other, for the purification of seeing. And by seeing here, we mean inside or inside knowledge. And so it's this noble eight-factored path that is the bewilderment of Mara. And additionally, it defined the path as the seven factors of enlightenment. And it quoted the Upavana Sutta. So if we are suvacha, so if we are easy to instruct, then we will follow the Buddha's instructions by learning, memorizing, discussing, contemplating, developing and penetrating with wisdom, these sutta meditations or insight pathways that help us to either develop the Noble Eightfold Path or and all the seven factors of enlightenment. Much of the wrong path and practice gets corrected when we understand the Buddha's instructions on these Pujankas because they are linked with the development of the Noble Eightfold Path. So it leads with right view and all the other path factors follow and all the way up to right concentration and entering into the four jhanas. There is certainly a relationship between the four jhanas and developing the bhujangas. We briefly touched on this in our Dhamma session on the noble five-factored right concentration, which was based on the Pachangika Sutta, or otherwise known as the Samadanga Sutta. Being able to understand the relationship is very useful to ensuring that we are developing these things correctly. It becomes quite evident to those who are proficient in both to recognize when others may be developing something outside the Buddha's teachings and therefore don't get the same results as the Buddha. It may be that they can't explain what the Buddha means in the discourses because they've misinterpreted the Buddha's teachings or have mixed them with other teachings outside of the Buddha's dispensation or have regarded certain fundamental parts of the Buddha's teaching that establish right view and they've disregarded them or simply made up their own stuff. In any case, understanding this Dhamma correctly will help to highlight these things and bring us to the Buddha's noble path. Let's now turn our attention towards the Bhujangas. So these statements are about the manifestation of a Tathagata and they come from the Bhujanga Samyutta. The first is from the Patama Upana Sutta, and it says, because these seven factors of enlightenment developed and cultivated, if unarisen, do not arise apart from the appearance of a Tathagata, an Arahant, a perfectly enlightened one. And the next is the Dutya Upana Sutta. 
And this says these seven factors of enlightenment developed and cultivated, if unarisen, do not arise apart from the discipline of a fortunate one. And the last sutta reference is from the Chakravati Sutta. And here it says, with the manifestation of a Tathagata because an Arahant, a perfectly enlightened one, comes the manifestation of the seven gems of the factors of enlightenment. What we can understand from these statements is that the Bhujangas can only arise with the appearance or manifestation of the Buddha and the Buddha's teachings. So they are unique to the Buddha's dispensation. Similar statements are also made with regard to the Noble Eightfold Path in the Magga Sanyutta, and there are a number of discourses there. There are also discourses where followers of other traditions believe their teachings develop the Noble Eightfold Path and the Seven Factors of Enlightenment, but the Buddha explained in those circumstances how this was not the case at all. It was not true. With regard to the Bhujangas, there's an instance highlighted in the Pariyaya Sutta where wanderers of other sects declared their teachings abandoned the five hindrances and correctly developed the seven factors of enlightenment. And we will examine that particular sutta later on. And the Buddha's answer uh, in that sutta is actually quite interesting. So in a different Dhamma session, we'll go through it. The Buddha's answer and knowing how to meditate on it demonstrates how amazing and complete the Buddha's teachings truly are one has no doubt they lead to the complete ending of suffering. So why are they called factors of enlightenment? The Pali word bojanga is derived from bodhi and anga. Bodhi can be translated as enlightenment, awakening, or knowledge or wisdom of the Buddha. And anga can be translated as a constituent part or a factor. So this is how we translate bojanga as factor of enlightenment or factor of awakening or factor of the knowledge or wisdom of the Buddha. With this in mind, let's now look at the Bhikkhu Sutta. And this is where a certain Bhikkhu approached the Blessed One and asked him, Venerable Sir, it is said, factors of enlightenment, factors of enlightenment. In what sense are they called factors of enlightenment? And the Buddha answered, they lead to enlightenment bhikkhu, therefore they are called factors of enlightenment. In Pali, this is buddhaya sambhatantiti ko bhikkhu tasama bojangati buchanti. And it goes on to say, here bhikkhu, one develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, so this is satisambhujanga, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion and cessation, maturing and release. And then it goes on for the other six factors, which are Investigation of Dhamma, uh, in energy, rapture, uh, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. And they're all based upon seclusion, dispassion, cessation, maturing, and release. And it says, while one is developing these seven factors of enlightenment, one's mind is liberated from the taint of sensuality, from the taint of existence, from the taint of ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it's liberated. One understands destroyed is birth. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. They lead to enlightenment, bhikkhu. Therefore, they are called factors of enlightenment. In a nutshell, why we develop the seven factors of enlightenment, in accordance with the Buddha's instructions, of course, is because it will all lead to buddhaya, enlightenment, awakening meaning it leads to the ending of suffering, the ending of greed, hatred, and delusion. As the Buddha has said in a number of discourses, for example, in this Udambarika Sutta, Dikinikaya Discourse Number 25, or Chula Sachaka Sutta, this is Machimnikaya 35, it's said in those discourses, the Blessed One is enlightened, and he teaches the Dhamma for the sake of enlightenment. So clearly we develop the factors of enlightenment, for the sake of enlightenment. We know that the Buddha would often use similes to help us to connect with the Dhamma. For the Bhujangas, he gave the simile of the rafters of a peak house. In the Kutagara Sutta, the Buddha stated, because just as all the rafters of a peaked house slant slope and incline towards the roof peak, so too, when a bhikkhu develops and cultivates the seven factors of enlightenment, he slants, slopes, and inclines towards nibbana. So that is something for us to contemplate. 
When we develop and cultivate the Bhujangas, they help us to incline slant slope towards Nibbana. And the Buddha also makes reference similarly to this peaked roof in the Kosambiya Sutta, if you remember. This is Majjhima Discourse number 48. So that's the discourse we've gone through before about harmony and community. And the Buddha stated there that just as the chief, the most cohesive, the most unifying part of a peaked house is the peak itself, so too of these six principles of cordiality, the chief is this view that is noble and emancipating. The reason I bring this up here is to recognize the link to the Noble Eightfold Path, beginning with the right view, the view that is noble and emancipating, which will lead to Nibbana. In the next summer session, when we look at each factor of enlightenment, this will become more evident. The Buddha has given many teachings on how to develop and cultivate the Bojangas. And if we understand this Dhamma, the Bojangas activate or can be activated with the Sutta meditations we have already learned as well. And so the Buddha stated in the Virada Sutta that because those who have neglected the seven factors of enlightenment, have neglected the noble path, leading to the complete destruction of suffering. Those who have undertaken the seven factors of enlightenment have undertaken the noble path, leading to the complete destruction of suffering. So this is the Buddha's encouragement to us. So we want to be part of the group that is undertaking to develop the seven factors of enlightenment. When we have come across the reference to the Bojangas before in our Sutta meditations, it's been in the Avija Sutta. This is Anguttara Nikaya, chapter 10, discourse number 61. If you remember in this discourse, the Buddha taught about the different nourishment for ignorance and also the nourishment for true knowledge and liberation. When it comes to ignorance, this would lead to continued rebirth in samsara, so it kicks off dependent origination. And true knowledge and liberation, of course, would lead to realizing Nibbana and the ending of this whole mass of suffering. When we examine these insight pathways that we have on this slide, we see that the hindrances, the Nibbanas, nourish ignorance, whereas the factors of enlightenment, the Bhujangas, nourish true knowledge and liberation. And in a number of discourses, including the Ayoniso Manisikara Sutta, the Buddha has also stated that unwisely contemplating, so ayonis or manisikara, grows the hindrances, while wisely contemplating, yonis or manisikara, grows the factors of enlightenment. And so this becomes quite key when we start to look more at each factor of enlightenment. Each of them uh, are said to require wise contemplation. So we can see why the Buddha consistently instructs us to abandon the five hindrances, never to tolerate them, indulge them, never to nourish them, and to instead develop and nourish the seven factors of enlightenment. The Buddha's teachings in the Bhujanga Sangyutta highlight this inverse relationship quite significantly. And we'll now look at some of the Buddha's words that shine the light on this. So in the Bojanga Sangyuta, there are a number of passages. So I'll just read them out. So this first instance is about the factors of enlightenment. And it says, when developed and cultivated, are noble and emancipating, they lead the one who acts upon them out to the complete destruction of suffering. So this is the Arya Sutta. And then it says, when developed and cultivated, lead to utter revulsion, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. And that was the Nibbana Sutta. And from the Anupakilesa Sutta and Avarana Nibbana Sutta, it says the Bhujangas are non-obstructions, non-hindrances, non-corruptions of the mind. When developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the fruit of true knowledge and liberation. And then the Yonis Omansikara Sutta says, when one wisely contemplates, the unarisen enlightenment factors arise and the arisen enlightenment factors go to fulfillment by development. And then the Buddhi Sutta says, when developed and cultivated, the Bhujangas lead to growth, to non-decline. And then we have the Nivarana Sutta, which says, the Bhujangas are makers of vision, makers of knowledge, promoting the growth of wisdom, free from vexation, leading towards Nibbana. 
And then the Vidya Sutta says, whatever ascetics or Brahmins in the past, in the future, at present, abandon the three discriminations, which are I am superior, I am equal, I am inferior, all do so because they have developed and cultivated these seven factors of enlightenment. And the very last one is the Mara Sutta, which says, Bojangas are the path crushing the army of Mara. So these are wonderful, wonderful things that go with cultivating the Bojangas. In contrast to that, when it comes to the hindrances, also from selected suttas in the Bojanga Sangyutta, the Buddha has said, the hindrances, these are the five corruptions of the mind, corrupted by which the mind is neither malleable, nor wieldy, nor radiant, but brittle and not rightly concentrated for the destruction of the taints. So that was the Upakilesa Sutta. And then again, the Avara, Avarana Nibarana Sutta says, uh, these are the five obstructions, hindrances, corruptions of the mind, weakness of wisdom. And then again, the Yonisul Manasikara Sutta says, when one unwisely contemplates, the unarisen hindrances arise and the arisen hindrances go to fulfillment by development. And the very last one is the Nibbana Sutta, which says, the five hindrances are the makers of blindness, causing lack of vision, causing lack of knowledge, detrimental to wisdom, tending to vexation, leading away from Nibbana. So we can see when we take these words to our mind, the significance and urgency of abandoning the five hindrances and developing the seven bojangas becomes quite active and present. And then this next sutta called the Anivarana Sutta as well, it also highlights the inverse or contrary relationship between the hindrances and the bojangas. And it says, when because a noble disciple listens to the Dhamma with eager ears, attending to it as a matter of vital concern, directing his whole mind to it, on that occasion the five hindrances are not present in him. On that occasion the seven, seven factors of enlightenment go to fulfillment by development. What is interesting about this sutta is it has similar wording to one of the seven factors of a person who is ready to realize the fruit of stream entry or has already uh, fruit of attainment. More specifically, it aligns with one of the strengths of a person with right view. And again, we can refer to the Kosambiya Sutta, because in that Sutta, at the end, it says, this is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he heeds it, gives it attention, engages it with all his mind, he is the Dhamma as with eager ears. So the Buddha's words in the Anibarana Sutta make even more sense because it is by activating or uplifting one's Magabala Chitta, so the mind that has noble attainment through listening to the Dhamma with eager ears. So then we contemplate it and we direct our whole mind to it. And so we are not troubled by the hindrances and can develop the Bojangas to fulfillment. So someone with the right view can even enter the stream through this approach as well. That's what's inferred by the strength of a person with right view. And of course, there are other things that are listed in the Kosambiya Sutta that enable one to enter the stream. So it's not just that alone. So the Buddha then has a set of uh, suttas that are quite interesting because it makes you ask certain questions when it comes to the Bojangas. And the first two are the Dupanya Sutta and also the Panyavanta Sutta. And in the first one, it says, Venerable Sir, it is said, an unwise dolt, an unwise dolt. So in Pali, this is Dupanyo Elamugo. In what way, Venerable Sir, is one called an unwise dolt? And the Buddha answers, because it is because one has not developed and cultivated the seven factors of enlightenment that one is called an unwise dolt. And in contrast to that, the Buddha then declares, or again, he's been asked, Venerable Sir, it is said, wise and alert, wise and alert. So this is Panyava Anelamuga. So in what way, Venerable Sir, is one called wise and alert? And the Buddha answers, because it is because one has developed and cultivated the seven factors of enlightenment that one is called wise and alert. So Panyava 
Anand Muga. Hmm. So we can ask ourselves, do we wish to be wise and alert or do we wish to be called an unwise adult? And of course, we wish to be wise and alert. So we want to develop and cultivate the seven factors of enlightenment in accordance with the Buddha's instructions. So this is our encouragement. And then the next set of suttas is the Dalida Sutta and the Adalida Sutta. And this is in reference to whether we are poor or prosperous. So this is in a similar fashion. He's asked, Venerable Sir, it is said, poor, poor. So we know this is Dalidal. In what way, Venerable Sir, is one called poor? And then the Buddha answers, because it is because one has not developed and cultivated the seven factors of enlightenment that one is called poor. So most of us do not, not like to be labelled as poor or to even be poor. And in contrast to that, the Buddha declared, or actually, um, he was asked, Venerable Sir, it is said, prosperous, prosperous. So this is Antalindo. Uh, so the opposite of being poor. In what way, Venerable Sir, is one called prosperous? And the Buddha answers, because it is because one has developed and cultivated the seven factors of enlightenment that one is called prosperous. So again, we can ask ourselves, do we wish to be poor or do we, should we wish to be prosperous? And of course, we wish to be prosperous. So this is our encouragement to develop and cultivate the seven factors of enlightenment. We can now broadly look at what the Buddha instructed for applying the Bhujangas. So this is a sample of what we can expect in terms of the application. The most commonly stated one is with regard to recovering from illness. So within the Bhujanga Sangyutta, there is the Gilana Vagga or the chapter on illness. And there's three specific suttas, which is 14, 15 and 16, where it says, by wisely contemplating the seven factors of enlightenment, one can recover from illness. And two of them relate to one is Venerable Mahakasapa and the other is Venerable Mahamukulana and both were Sikh. And the Buddha taught them the Vajangas in each case, and they were both elated by the teaching. In each instance, they recovered from that illness. And similarly, the Buddha was Sikh and Venerable Mahachunda recited the Vajangas, and the Buddha approved of what he had said, and he also recovered from that illness. So this is very good reason to develop and cultivate the Vajangas. When we start to understand how the Vajangas work, excuse me, in future Dhamma sessions, they'll become clearer why the Buddha has said that contemplate the Bhujanga, one can recover from illness. So that's not for us to delve into right here, but we'll do so in the future. So proper understanding of the Dhamma is an essential part of it. And uh, we'll go through that at another time. Another thing that has been stated in regard to applying the Bhujangas, and this time by Venerable Sariputta, and this is from the Vata Sutta, it says that if we become skilled in the Bhujangas, whichever enlightenment factor one wishes to dwell in at any time of the day, so morning, noon or night, it can be developed. Like one might want to wear different coloured clothes. So here, uh, Venerable Sariputta was giving a simile of some sort of if you were to change your clothes, that's how you can change from one enlightenment factor to another once they're all activated. So that's quite useful, particularly when you understand the nature of one's mind. And then in the Agi Sutta, which is very complementary to what we said about the Vata Sutta, the Buddha explained how to apply the Bhujangas when the mind is sluggish versus when the mind is excited. And in that way, he revealed which factors of enlightenment are arousing and which factors of enlightenment are calming. So in the Agi Sutta, the Buddha says, when the mind becomes sluggish, it is untimely to develop the enlightenment factors of tranquility, concentration, or equanimity. For what reason? Because the mind is sluggish, because, and it is not easy to arouse it with those things. So basically to calming. And then when the mind becomes excited, it is untimely to develop the enlightenment factors of discrimination of state. So we also know that as investigation of Dhamma, also energy and also rapture. So for what reason? Because the mind is excited because, and it is difficult to calm it down with those things. So those are the arousing enlightenment factors. So as we can see from this broad review, 
The Bojangas can be very beneficial once we understand the nature of the mind. We can develop and cultivate the Bojangas to overcome physical illness, but more importantly, to support the mind to be uplifted, purified with right view, and therefore not allowing the mind to sicken or stay sick or to slide or to weaken. So this is very important. And another application that I want to touch on briefly is with regard to the doorways to Nibbana or the profitable directions. And these we've been gradually learning and developing. So next month we'll be studying the third doorway, which has been highlighted in, in yellow. And this is the pleasant practice with slow realization. So the third profitable direction. And we know this in Pali as Sukha Paribada, Danda Binya. And part of why we are starting to look at Bojangas is to help, help us to develop this insight pathway. So you can see that the enlightenment factors are, are actually part of the insight pathway, but that doesn't mean that we don't develop them as we go along. So it's really good to be able to know how to activate the Bojangas. It's also good to mention here that the Bojangas are not just helpful for this particular pathway. It's also playing a part in the other pathways as well. And it will make more sense once we understand the interconnectedness of both developing the Noble Eightfold Path and the Bojangas. They're not separate, they work together, as do the other Bodhipakya Dhammas. And this is how completely linked and perfect the Buddha's teachings actually are. Once you start to understand more of this Dhamma, it becomes quite apparent. And hence, you see why the Buddha continuously encourages us to abandon unskilled states and to keep increasing all these skilled states. So more on that as we uh, come to the third uh, profitable direction next month. In this next sutta, which comes from the numerical discourses, it's called the Uttiya Sutta, on Nikaya chapter 10, discourse number 95. This is where the Buddha was being questioned by the wanderer Uttiya about the cosmos. And the Buddha remained silent throughout all the questioning. And to ensure the wanderer Uttiya did not misconceive the Buddha's silence, Venerable Ananda stated this particular passage. The Tathagata has no concern whether the entire world would be emancipated or half the world or a third of the world, but he can be sure that all those who have been emancipated or who are being emancipated or who will be emancipated from the world first abandon the five hindrances, corruptions of the mind that weaken wisdom, and then with their minds well established in the four establishments of mindfulness, develop correctly the seven factors of enlightenment. It is in this way that they have been emancipated or are being emancipated or will be emancipated from the world. So this inverse relationship between the hindrances and the bojangas is highlighted yet again. But this time with the added ingredient of well establishing the four establishments of mindfulness. So we know this in Pali as Satipatthana. In our subsequent sessions, we will examine how the Buddha begins the development of the Bojangas with this development of mindfulness factor of enlightenment and how it also uh, comes to be because we establish the four establishments of mindfulness, the Satipatthana. Now, quite often we overlook how the Buddha often instructed the Sangha to establish the foundations or establishments of mindfulness. And it is something that we have looked at in other Sutta meditations. So we will draw on that in future. Now, if we also reflect on how the Buddha continually encourages us to enter the jhanas as part of the training in higher concentration, we know that by Properly contemplating the Dhamma, which is any of our sutta meditations, we can enter the first jhana concentration and more, but it's primarily at the first jhana concentration that the five hindrances cease. Likewise, what we will learn with the Bojangas is when we correctly contemplate the Dhamma, establish the Satipatthana, then we develop this Satisambojanga, and therefore the mind concentrates. And again, also the five hindrances cease. So we can see the same process activate. And we are happy because it will inevitably lead to emancipation from the world. Now, when we get down to the nitty gritty of what we contemplate when developing, it helps to see the importance of applying the Buddha's instructions, not anything else. And I will repeat this quite often because quite 
uh, what, what is usual is people stray from the Buddha's instructions and so they don't get the same result as the Buddha. So this is really an encouragement to walk the tried and tested path of a Sammasam Buddha, the perfectly enlightened one, because the noble disciples have realized this same enlightenment for themselves. And so we know that this is the safe path, the one that results in complete liberation, Nibbana. So in our previous Dhamma session where we talked about walking meditation and its benefits, and also earlier in this session, we mentioned that one of the ways of striving is striving by development. So bhavana padanana, bhavana padana. And we know from numerous teachings of the Buddha that arousing energy, applying effort, having endurance, striving, it's all a huge part of this spiritual path and practice. Complete liberation, Nibbana, doesn't just happen spontaneously. However, there are things that we may we may have practiced in the in the past or in previous births, or things that we are doing now to sharpen our powers, our spiritual faculties, and all these other bodhipakya dhammas and the like, and they enable us to make swifter progress on the noble path. So the development of the Bhojangas is one of those things. And as the Buddha says in this particular sutta, which is the Sangara Sutta. Anguttara Nikaya chapter 4, discourse number 14, says, and what is striving by development? Here, Abhikhu develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, which is based on seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, maturing and release. It develops the enlightenment factor of investigation of Dhamma, the enlightenment factor of energy, the enlightenment factor of rapture, the enlightenment factor of tranquility, the enlightenment factor of concentration, the enlightenment factor of equanimity, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, maturing, and release. This is called striving by development. So the phrase that goes with each of the enlightenment factors is quite important. It says, based upon seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, maturing, and release. And the Buddha uses this same phrase throughout many of the suttas in the Bhujanga Sangyutta numerous times, and so we'll delve into the meaning behind this and what it alludes to in future session. As we also mentioned earlier, the Buddha taught in a number of discourses that the taints should be abandoned by uh, developing the Bhojangas. So we know from the Nibedika Sutta, this is Ankutu Nikaya chapter 6, discourse number 63, that ignorance is the source and origin of the taints. So with the cessation of ignorance, there is the cessation of the taints, which means we don't activate and kick off the dependent origination. So the taints that we're talking about here are the taint of sensual desire, so karmasava, taint of existence, bhavasava, taint of views, titiyasava, and taint of ignorance, avijasava. And sometimes the taint of views is not explicitly stated, and when this is the case, it's included in the taint of ignorance. Now, the Buddha has taught that the result of the taints is one is immersed in ignorance. And so this will produce a corresponding individual existence due to dependent origination, which may be the consequence of either merit or demerit. And so the result of taints is we can expect a future arising that is bound for suffering. So in the Sabhasava Sutta, which is the discourse on all the taints, Majminikaya discourse number two, the Buddha taught about seven ways to abandon the taint. So abandoned by seeing, abandoned by restraining, abandoned by using, abandoned by enduring, abandoned by avoiding, abandoned by removing, and abandoned by developing. And what is important to understand of these seven is that only two lead to the supramundane path and practice. So when we abandon the taints by seeing, it's because of the right view that we can realize noble attainment and abandoning the taints by developing the Bhujangas is how we can directly destroy the taints. So this is super mundane path and practice. The other five ways of abandoning taints only remove them temporarily without destroying them. So the, although this may be helpful at times, it won't lead to the destruction of the taints and therefore won't lead to complete liberation. And the Buddha did say in the Sabhasava Sutta, because I say that the destruction of the taints is for one who knows and sees, not for one who does not know and see. Who knows and sees what? 
And the Buddha refers to wise contemplation and unwise contemplation. When one contemplates unwisely, unarisen taints arise and arisen taints increase. When one contemplates wisely, unarisen taints do not arise and arisen taints are abandoned. And you can see from this session how important wise contemplation actually is. Yonuso Manasikara. So it plays a big role when it comes to developing the Bojangas. And here, we're not talking about wisely contemplating just any phenomena, but the Buddha's instructions, his actual precise and sequential teachings on this Dhamma. In other words, if we were to broadly say, it's about how things arise and how things cease, such as fully penetrating how does suffering come to arise and how does suffering come to complete cessation. Like the most important thing about this path and practice. And we already know from the Avija Sutta that by establishing the Satipatthana, this nourishes the Bhojangas, which helps to nourish true knowledge and liberation. And, and this is in contrast to the other pathway, which is to nourish ignorance. So we are creating a pathway that leads to Nibbana. That is very, very strong because it's linked to destroying the taint. So in this Sabhasava Sutta and similar suttas, the Buddha has stated, here a bhikkhu reflecting wisely or contemplating wisely develops the mindfulness enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion and cessation and ripens in relinquishment. And it says similar thing for investigation of Dhamma enlightenment factor, energy enlightenment factor, rapture enlightenment factor, tranquility enlightenment factor, concentration enlightenment factor, and finally equanimity enlightenment factor, all of which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation and ripens in relinquishment. So we will definitely look into that more further along in other subsequent sessions. And then importantly, it says, while taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who does not develop these enlightenment factors, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who develops them. And these are called the taints that should be abandoned by developing. So very, very important stuff. And at some later point, we will study the Sabhasava Sutta. It's a very important sutta for us to look at. So there's this Kinasava Sutta on Kutunikaya, Chapter 10, Discourse 90, where the Buddha asks Venerable Sariputta about how many powers does a bhikkhu possess by reason of which he can claim to have attained the destruction of the taints. And here the Buddha is referring to someone who is Kinasava, someone who has destroyed the taints. Venerable Sariputta responded to the Buddha by saying that there are 10 powers by reason of which a person can claim to have attained the destruction of the taints. And on this slide, it lists out the 10 powers. And I won't read them out, but they're remarkable and incredibly inspiring. Uh, what you see is that so much has been seen through, or you could say seen clearly or thoroughly with wisdom by such a person. And therefore, they've abandoned so much, so much of the unwholesome. And such a person has fully perfected all these wholesome dhammas. So one of the ten powers is they have developed and well-developed the seven factors of enlightenment. So what we can do is we've come to the end of this particular session, which is our introduction to the Bhojangas. So we can end this session with these few verses uttered by the Buddha when he gave a teaching to the monks in the Parangama Sutta. And this is in the Magga Sangyutta, so chapter 45 of Sangyutta Nikaya, discourse number 34. And here the Buddha was talking about eight things when developed and cultivated lead to going beyond the near shore to the far shore. And the eight things he was referring to there are the Noble Eightfold Path. And so in these verses, the Buddha speaks of minds that are well developed in the Bojangas. The last part of these verses, which are underlined on the slide here, they were also uttered to 500 visiting bhikkhus who went to pay homage to the Buddha at Jethava Monastery at the end of Avasa. So uh, let's read these out. Few are those among humankind to go beyond to the far shore. So far shore is always complete cessation, uh, Nibbana. The rest of the people merely run up and down the bank. 
along the bank. When the Dhamma is rightly expounded, those who practice in accordance with the Dhamma are the people who will go beyond the realm of death so hard to cross. Having left behind the dark qualities, the wise man should develop the bright ones. Having come home into having come from home into homelessness, where it is hard to take delight, there in seclusion he should seek delight. Having left behind sensual pleasures, owning nothing, the wise man should cleanse himself of mental defilement, defilements. Those whose minds are well developed in the factors of enlightenment, who through non-clinging find delight. In the relinquishment of grasping, those luminous ones with taints destroyed are fully quenched in the world. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We've now come to the end of part one on the Bojangas or factors of enlightenment. And we can see now how they fit in with the Buddhist teachings and why they are so valuable and important. In the next part, part two on the Bojangas, we will delve into each of the seven factors of enlightenment and we'll look at a particular meditation to see how we can develop them in a very straightforward kind of way and how they align with developing right concentration by entering the four jhanas. We'll see the complementary um, approaches that exist there. So let's end our session with gratitude to the Buddha for these teachings. We can share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem, Better One Saturday night.